Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Dugons and Sea Dragons, your weekly actual play fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons podcast. Um, brought to you tonight live from the SCCSNY, uh, hosted by our very good friends at the American Museum of Natural History, the other AMNH. Um, uh, we have a uh, in game, we have the Aranax Museum of Natural History, which we've had a couple of capers based out of. Um, and natural history museums have always been near and dear to our heart, and then there's none more so near and dear than the AMNH uh, in New York. Um, I've worked there for on and off for most of my professional life. And so I'm thrilled to be able to, um, to uh, partner up with them. Um, so I wanted to, uh, to welcome you all. This is a workshop on, on using gameplay for uh, science communication. Uh, and I wanted to talk, uh, start off a little bit about um, some of the, the data we've collected, right? So we've been doing dugongs and sea dragons for about two and a half years now. Um, and about uh, a year and a half ago, we put out a survey to our membership to um, kind of see what they, what they thought about it. So I'm gonna try to share my screen. I think after a year and a half this, we'd be good at this. Um, there we go. All right, can everybody see that? All right, cool. So. Um, we were, or we were, we we're hoping to be publishing these data soon. So uh, don't don't share them too widely. But um, it's unlikely like, that you're going to go out and get your own uh, Dungeons and Dragons podcast to take the data for. So I'm not too worried about it. Um, but let me just walk you through a little bit about what we have. So um, obviously my slides are out of order. So um, the first thing we wanted to ask is is why do people come and and why are why are they listening to Dugongs and Sea Dragons? Um, and I think the thing that struck me the most is that uh, over a third of people came really for the D and D. Um, I think it, had you asked me before doing this, I would have felt that we were kind of preaching to the choir that um, because this podcast started as uh, an outreach event at the International Marine Conservation Congress, one of the Society for Conservation Biology's uh, groups. I would have thought that we were really drawing primarily from, um, from people who are interested in marine biology. Um, but only about a quarter of, us, uh, of our audience is coming expressly to learn about marine biology, probably about a third when you throw in marine conservation. So it looks like people really just like listening to us play D&D &D as well. Um, they're, not, they're, they're coming for the D&D &D and learning about the, uh, the, the, the science on the side. Um, and then when we asked why they, they stayed, the percentages are, are roughly about the same. So um, it seems like, to me, I'm interpreting this as we're getting a, a more diverse audience than, uh, than people who are uh, sort of already marine professionals. Um, and uh, you know that's, that's borne out in terms of, um, sorry, we'll go here. So that's borne out here. So 40% um, uh, of our audience has a job or a hobby related to marine biology or conservation. So uh, six out of 10 people aren't sort of in the field. Uh, they, but when you look at the knowledge base that they have, uh, only 7% you know, said they had no, no information about marine biology. Um, and 45% said they had at least some knowledge of it. So, um, so we're getting people who are not necessarily out uh, who are not necessarily in the marine biology community, but uh, people do have a, at least some baseline information for it. Uh, interestingly enough, though, when we look afterwards, uh, we saw, let me slide these around so I can pop these back and forth more easily here. So this is kind of the, the what their knowledge was coming in. 30% said they had a good knowledge. Afterwards, 61% said they had a good knowledge. So what we're seeing is that the, the audience feels like they're learning about marine biology. Um, my colleague, Jill Weiss, who uh, is the social scientist involved in this, uh, is very careful to say that we, we aren't actually testing to see if they've learned it. So there's, there's no exams on dugongs and sea dragons. So we can't actually see if they've gained that information, but they certainly feel like they are. And that to me is, uh, is important. Um, when we uh, have them, uh, when we take, have them, um, leave after listening or after feeling about it, um, I guess 0% disagree that they, uh, with the statement that they felt like they've learned about marine biology. So everybody feels like they've learned something. Um, uh, and 41% strongly agree with that. So I think um, 
people are are learning things, that they are feeling engaged about it. Um, and importantly for us, in terms of hitting the the tone right, um, set, you know, three quarters of the people said that they thought that uh, the facts were accessible, um, and that I think is important for us because. You know, I'm, I'll be honest with you. I'm a professor, and pedantry is my 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 middle name, right? So it's very easy for us to get really down into the weeds. Of, and I think we do cover some some complex topics in here, but um, you know, we somehow balance that out with the shenanigans to a point that we're able to get those those topics across really really well. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing here and kind of come back to the group. Um, and Trav, do you want to talk a little bit? Because you and I and, and Chris were involved sort of in the creation of this. Do you guys want to say, say a little bit about how the whole thing started? Yeah, sure. Chris, why don't you go ahead and you're kind of the, you're the main inspiration. I just made it happen. <laughs> so once upon a time, there was a conference called the International Marine Conservation Congress. And uh, I believe Josh was part of the program committee. Yep. And there were several other members of the program committee who let it slip that they were big Dungeons and Dragons fans. And at the same time, uh, Speak Up for Blue Network was producing, uh, producing marine science podcasts. And uh, there was a plan to have a sort of a live session at the end of the conference to basically record it and then put that in podcast form to talk about the conference. And sort of one thing led to another and it ended up, well, why don't we just play a game of Dungeons and Dragons and record it and put it out onto the, the Marine Conservation Happy Hour podcast. So, um, Travis was organizing a lot of the logistics of that conference. So he made it happen. And uh, some members of the audience of that conference included Francis and Matt, who then became regular players. And uh, when we put this out on the Marine Conservation Happy Hour, it had such a huge download rate. And uh, we got really positive comments from all around the world decided, well, why don't we just turn this into a podcast? And so we did. So I started off as the producer, taking the episodes and editing them. And then um, Travis ended up taking over when I went to work for the government and didn't have time anymore. Um, and that's how the show uh, started. And it goes out, really goes internationally. Mm -hmm. um, it's got into the top 20 of... Um, nature podcasts in a ridiculous number of countries like 30 to 40 countries around the world and in some countries it's actually the top science podcast um it's gets a really good download rate in a lot of african countries in southeast asia um, so it really has gone international and uh, we've even managed to get into the top 10 simultaneously in the nature podcasts and the gaming podcast um, top 10 in the same week. So that's probably <laughs> the only podcast that's ever managed to do that. And that you know, always blows my mind because um, as you're about to see, uh, we are not professionals. Um, this, this is not uh, a reincarnation of critical role. Um, so, maybe lower the expectations a little bit but um so you know this is kind of like you know our 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 it's like our bowling league it's like we're a bunch of friends and we hang out and we do this but yet it's somehow um had this this tremendous impact um and that is always astounding to me and and honestly something i'm incredibly proud of and, and thrilled that we've been able to do this. And I'm glad that so many of you are, are showing up here because um, I think it really speaks to the power of creativity when thinking about science outreach, uh, of not just being like, I'm on Twitter, ergo, I'm doing science outreach, um, and, and thinking about the ways to, to build community because um, you know we do have, uh, we've got a, a, a Patreon, we've got a pretty active um, you know, Twitter following, and 
and it is fun to be able to to work with our audience members. And and I know I've definitely fielded questions uh, from listeners over uh, either email or, or Twitter DMs about um, about like the biology the underlying it. When when they didn't quite understand something, they've they've come out, and and that's wonderful that people are have access to a scientist and have uh, we, and I feel like we've lowered the barriers to being able to talk to people about science. And so um, I'm, I'm just incredibly thrilled about that. Um, let's see, uh, Andrew. So I wanted to, to bring you in a little bit too, because um, you are not uh, in the biology side of this per se. Could you talk a little bit about um your diversity of backgrounds, because I think the other thing that I love about this is that we show that there's lots of different ways to be involved in marine conservation. It doesn't have to be through doing, you know, a, an academic route. Sure. So uh, thank you. Um, my name is Andrew Kornblatt. And among other things, I produce and co-host the podcast Ocean Science Radio. Um, and we've been doing that for about five, six years now. Jeez. Um but the uh, long and short of it is I come from a communications and policy background. I've worked for, you know, California state government, uh, city governments, uh, done some federal work as well in the United States and some help on uh, international uh, efforts as well. And in that work, I've worked for groups such as, you know, IUCN, NOAA, et cetera, with not just communications and awareness campaigns, but also activations and uh, just general movement of uh, policy efforts around uh, ocean conservation and some climate work as well. Um, with this podcast, I get to do some of that same type of work but be super silly and fun while also learning some ridiculously awesome biology and, and factoids about ocean science and the history of science. So really it's just been an incredible honor to be able to play and, and hang out with these peeps who, who are, are just amazing, smart, awesome people and fantastic players as well. Do you want to tell everyone about our special guest star who ended up being the voice of the Kraken and how you managed to organize that? She sure. was a Kraken, she was an oracle. Yeah, she was an oracle. Uh, oracle. So in my work, I've also done a lot of work with uh, groups like the International Ocean Film Festival and some groups like Mission Blue, uh, which was Sylvia or is Sylvia Earle's uh, conservation and awareness building organization and uh on a whim i reached out to sylvia and said hey i'm participating in this podcast do you want to be a guest voice and she said sure so we we sent her over a script and she actually read the part for a oracle that helps us and gives us uh, various little treats uh, throughout throughout the era uh, throughout the episodes um one of the things that I will never forget about that experience is so they, they sent, she sent, she and her uh, team sent over the video recording uh, because apparently she was recording a couple of different things that day. And when she was reading it, she's like, Oh, so this isn't Sylvia saying this, this is something, something else. And, and apparently uh, just started cracking up when she read it for the, for the first round, which, uh, which, was just an amazing experience and I still can't believe that we got Dr. Sylvia Earle to be a guest voice for our podcast. Yeah that, that was quite the coup. Um, well we've got uh, I promised that we would only do 15 minutes of, of intro stuff so I think I'm going to pass the mic over to uh, Travis Nielsen, who'll be DMing today. And I we're, we're going to go for about two hour and a half, two hours or so, right Trav? Yeah, that's the goal. So we would love yeah. to uh, for people after we're done with this adventure to stick around because we want to do a, a, a Q and A about podcasting or you know um, science communication writ large or new media approaches towards science things like that um, because we do want to make this as interactive. Um, Trav, do you want to do the Easter egg stuff too, or should do you want me to do that? Uh, you go ahead. Okay, so one of the traditions we have at our our live shows is that we have. Um, Easter eggs, scientific Easter eggs throughout the narrative. So if you 
may run across uh, you know, a street name, which is a, uh, uh, the name of a fault line or something like that. There will be science names littered throughout it. And so if you in the audience can, uh, can notify what one of those are, there will come a time where we have to make a roll. Uh, and a lot of Dungeons and Dragons is done through rolling 20 sided die like this. And, um, and if, if we as players want to make a roll, we can call upon the audience. And if you've identified one of those Easter eggs, we can uh, do what's called rolling advantage, which means we get to roll two 20 sided die um, and we can take the higher of the two. Uh, we also want to, I'm, I'm putting this up here because it's not the number 20, it is a little squid. Uh, we are sponsored by Crack and Dice. Um, they uh, have been with us since the very, very beginning. Um, and so if you are a player, uh, an audience member who correctly identifies uh, one of those Easter eggs and we get to call upon you, we are going to be able to give up to, I think we had four sets, I think, maybe maybe more. Uh, we'll be able to give out a set of, of crack and dice. So um, we'll take down your name and we will be able to mail that out to you. So normally in live shows that aren't virtual, we will throw them out to the audience, but um, I can't throw stuff at my computer. So um, keep your, your ears open and uh, you can help us as the players out and you might score a set of dice for yourself. So uh, with that, uh, Travis. So hi, everybody. I'm Travis Nielsen, and welcome to this wonderful live recording of Dugongs and Sea Dragons, an actual play 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons podcast hosted by marine scientists and marine conservation professionals. So I'm your host tonight, and I'm going to ask the players today to do a little longer introduction as part of this, mostly so that you can get a little to know us a little bit. So I'm going to give you my professional background and I'm going to give you my Dungeons and Dragons background. Okay. So I am what the smarter people like to call a decopod behavioral ecophysiologist, which is a fancy term for someone that likes to poke lobster and figure out how they behave and how their metabolic functions work. I spend a lot of time doing that sort of research. I'm slowly getting out of it and I'm actually becoming a high school educator and adult basic edu adult basic ed educator right now and i'm hoping to be able to utilize my skills in the future to do just that educate people about marine science and conservation and if i could have my dream i'd be doing this as a professional job so if any of you out there are like hey i want to hire that guy to play dungeons and dragons please do that I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons since I was 12 years old. I started with a system called Shadowrun, and then that built into Advanced Dungeons and Dragons and all the way up and through over the years. And so I've been DMing for a very long time, and I'm hoping today that you will have some fun listening to us play. I'm going to go through now, and I'm going to introduce our characters who will be playing. Please give the long introductions. I'm going to start with our very own Josh Drew, because, well, he used to be the DM, and I feel like I owe him that honor. Oh, well, thank you very much, Jeff. So I am Josh Drew. I'm an assistant professor at um, the State University of New York's College of Environmental Science and Forestry, or SUNY ESF. Um, and I see Felicity in here, who is also an ESF grad. So, uh, hey, Felicity. Um, and I am an assistant professor of uh, vertebrate conservation biologist um, uh, of vertebrate conservation biology. And at ESF, uh, I run uh, a lab looking at coupled human natural systems. So we do a lot of work with uh, community ecology, both in terms of uh, biological communities and how those biological communities interact with human communities uh, through the lens of um, traditional knowledge and um, and, and just and equitable conservation practices. Um, so I started playing D&D way, way back in the day when I was like mm, fourth or fifth grade, uh, played through high school, then took 25 years off. And like a lot of people kind of get got back in um, when uh, Wizards of the Coast uh, revamped Dungeons and Dragons to fifth edition. Um, and I'm, I couldn't be happier about it. Uh, and I should say, I, I will be playing Clog. Uh, Clog is a, uh, a goblin plumber uh, who was featured very, very early on and has been uh, mostly 
uh, playing in our children's games. We didn't talk about this, but we also have a, a set of canonical games for teens and preteens to help get them uh, into thinking about uh, sort of healthy approaches towards gaming. Um, and so Clog is sort of the, the shepherd of those, but uh, Clog is a, uh, a, a reformed, uh, a, a reformed bad guy who now works to help uh, the, the kids out, uh, the kids of this town of Aranax out. Um, and he has a really, really silly accent, which uh, I'm a little nervous because one of my graduate students is in here um, and she's never gonna have any respect for me after hearing this accent. Um, so that, uh, I've got Andrew next to me. So why don't you th go there? Um, I uh, have been playing Dungeons and Dragons since I was a wee child. Um, my first set was a box set given to me by my stepfather and I just like played it till the, the little metal figures broke. Um, and in this, season i have traditionally played a character named marmo who is a halfling bard but flavored to be a lawyer so all the spells are are like objection instead of counter spell and stuff like that so it's got that kind of flavoring uh for this episode i'm going to be playing edulis a flamboyant pirate who is a half sea elf and just you know wants to have fun with adventure um uh other than that i'm not quite sure what else to uh, elucidate on or elaborate on so i'm just looking forward to having fun with y'all thank you andrew i'm gonna ask for aaron to pipe up and introduce yourself now hi i'm aaron um i'm actually pretty new to D, &D. um i only started a few years ago when my then boyfriend now husband got me to start playing and when my former professor, Chris, asked me if I wanted to join uh, the show he was doing for Awesome Con. This, this was the first character I made, as opposed to just being handed a character sheet. So I've, I feel like both my character, Daharna, the, the druid, had I have both really grown through this show, and it's been a really fun experience. Uh, marine biology-wise, I studied marine biology in college. I've done some graduate certificate in science communication. And right now I am a professional illustrator and I've done work for a few different D&D &D expansions based on scientifically accurate monsters, which is great fun, so. Thank you, Erin. Erin mm -hmm. is also our artist in residence. You'll see my background. She did that. She also did uh, Chris Parsons background whom I'm going to ask introduce himself next. Chris, take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Parsons, and um, I play Lucy in Dark, the Tiefling Warlock, who you can see in the background here. And uh, via Lucian, I get to, uh, I guess, sort of deal with some issues I have about academia. And um, I used to be a professor at George mason university and my background is actually as a dolphin biologist this is where i met erin and uh, these days i'm actually working for the national science foundation in the division of ocean sciences and i've actually gone from being a professor to basically being a full-time science communicator these days so uh, that's my background and then i shall pass on to who's left have we done everyone I saw Frances. We should get her in to um, tell everyone who she is. I think she's sort of popped in and out. I'll double check if Frances is there. Uh, Frances, uh, blink once if you have the ability <laughs> to do an introduction for yourself. If not, uh, just say nothing and we'll figure it out. <laughs> but uh, I've been playing d d since I was... 11 years old in 1981 and our math teacher used to let us play at the back of the classroom if we finished all our math problems so it was a really good incentive to get our maths work done and done correctly because then we can play DD and do more math <laughs> okay it looks like we have francis on the line so francis please introduce yourself hi apologies for that uh and apologies i will be 
less participatory than some of the other players today. I am juggling some other work obligations. Uh, but my name is Frances Farabaugh. I am a PhD candidate at Florida International University. I study the behavioral ecology of reef sharks. A lot of my work involves video data. I ask questions about what drives abundances and distributions of sharks and what roles they play in the ecos their ecosystems, um, which is a lot of fun because I get to spend the rest of my natural life watching a lot of videos uh, of sharks, uh, which is a lot of work, but again, I get to watch videos of sharks. Um, in terms of my D&D &D background, I feel like I'm part of the new sort of D&D &D renaissance, um, and it's actually tied to my, my graduate studies as well. I discovered D&D &D when I was sort of doing some really mindless data entry, and I stumbled across a live play shows like Dimension 20 and uh, Critical Role and found them endlessly entertaining. And I had heard of, uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons before, but it had always been part of this sort of the the like corner of nerd culture that felt kind of gatekept and that like I didn't feel like it was for me and when I discovered what it was I was like oh this is just like Lord of the Rings and improv combined this is very me why didn't why didn't someone tell me before um and it was a just a golden opportunity when I discovered this particular group of uh of nerds at IMCC and uh, they were kind enough to, to take me on. Um, so I really enjoy science communication and storytelling through science communication, um, both in my sort of professional life and then in this sort of semi-professional life where I get to be a nerd and do marine science stuff and also Dungeons and Dragons. Thank you so much, Francis. And we are sorry that you can't join us in your full persona as you usually do. Please check her out on our regular podcast because as Callie and Pepper, she is always the highlight of the show. I suppose I should also plug, uh, I am also a cur the current co-host of Ocean Science Radio. I've got a couple other um, podcasts in the Speak Out for Blue network. Uh, it's currently on hiatus, but um, <laughs> me and a friend of mine host a podcast called Madam Curiosity, which is a podcast about historical women in STEM and current women in STEM talk about their favorite historical women uh, in STEM. And that's just another way I enjoy sharing the things I'm nerdy and passionate about with, with the world. So I should plug that as well. And uh, also you can catch me on Nat Geo sometimes during Shark Fest. <laughs> so plug that as well. We are also super happy to have both Aaron and Francis and uh, other guest stars coming on to our show outside of our regulars that add to our inclusion and diversity of not just bald headed bearded guys, because that's what we are mostly. And uh, as you can see, Andrew's crying in the corner. Um, it's been great to actually have a really diverse group of people uh, to share this story with because you'll end up learning that in D&D, &D, there's either people that love to do it for the math and the numbers, and there's people that do it for the story. And I feel like I've been truly blessed with this group to have a group of people that want to share story. And so that's what we're going to try and do today. So I'm going to get going. Uh, just so you're aware, um, all the characters that are playing today don't know any of the story in advance. And so it's going to be a lot of improv storytelling, and we're going to see how it goes. Cool. All right, so I'm about to get my stuff up here. Please forgive me and we'll do our best. <clears throat> Listeners, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city, Aranax, Sword Coast of Faerun. My name is Limulus. I work here. I'm a biologist for the AMNH, the Aranax Museum of Natural History. The Festival of the Shining Waters is in full swing, a special day when the Phacopatus, which loosely translates to battle crab in Elvish, come to the shores of Aranax to spawn. Every year, as the days lengthen in the spring and the water temperature rises, the townsfolk come out to see the beautiful sight of normally placid lagoons and bays roll and boil as the battle crabs come up to broadcast their sperm and eggs into the water. 
billions of tiny sperm and eggs with no care from the parents, most destined not for life, but to be part of the food chain for creatures of the subtitle, a classic type two, three reproductive strategy. After which these battle crabs return to their normal lives, burrowing through the sand of the bay in search for food and leftover bits of organic material and small invertebrates that live in the interstitial spaces between the grains of sand. The townsfolk come to watch the spawning because the sperm and eggs bioluminesce, making the water shimmer, making the water shine like it has been magically enchanted. The locals say that submerging yourself in the water has healing properties. Consequently, people come from miles around to watch the glow and bathe in the waters, hopefully to heal themselves from whatever may ail them. I have been studying these crabs for my adult life, working in the AMNH and the university, the Ivory Lyceum. I have been noticing that the population of crabs has been in decline, but I am not sure why. Unfortunately, due to the budget cuts my department has as a result of the new necromancy department and big necromancy funding the universities, I have been having difficulty getting support to investigate the loss of the battle crabs. I had no choice but to go before the city board of regents and beg their support. The only sympathetic ear in the group was Regent Balanoptra, who gave me a name, Clog. Turns out Clog was easy to find. He works part-time as a plumber for the city. Goblin, three foot five, with a calm attitude for a goblin. I plead my case to him. The festival would be lost forever if we couldn't find out why the battle crabs were disappearing. Clog agrees to help. He said he knew some people that could be trusted to figure it out. The Cephalus Squad. Lucian and Edulus, we have now set the story. You have come back from Imrox Hold with a fresh shipment of fresh ale from Carl and toffees from Pepper made specially for the festival. You're enjoying a relaxing lunch at the Fog and Wraith with Darhana. Though not usually one for socializing and festivities, for Darhana, the festival of Shining Waters is like Christmas times a thousand. And she never misses it. As you're enjoying your pints and Lucien is regaling you with the topic of his new book, which is about a school of non-magical children in a world filled with magic, suddenly you get a waft of a most unpleasant odor. Lint, spit, unspeakable things from a kitten, and the mess left behind from a traveling circus. You know the kind. With a flash of insight, you realize Clog must be nearby. Hey, uh, guys, it's, uh, it's been a while. How you, how you guys been doing? Oh, how you all... How are you doing, Clog? Yes, yes. It's been a while. We've been quite busy over in Imrox Hold, you know, uh, organizing the new Pirate Republic and so on. Oh, I, sorry, not pirate. I mean, uh, uh, professional naval uh, ocean protectors, I, I think. Shepherds of the sea, almost. Oh, mm. well, you know, sometimes it, uh, sometimes it floats, sometimes it sinks, right? I, I, I don't know what you're talking about, little mm. goblin person, but it is lovely to see you again. What brings you to our table? Oh, actually, I don't know if we've ever had the, the chance to meet before. Hi, I'm Clog. How you doing? I, I'm Edulis. I thought that we had met before, but I meet quite a few tiny people in my line of work as an adventurer. Yeah, yeah. I'll try really hard to not pretend that you just said all us goblin folk look the same. Uh oh. I, apologies. No, no, uh, no, nothing, no harm intended or offense that's intended. All right. All right. Tall shanks. It's all good. Hey, um, Dahana, how you doing? I haven't seen you in a while either. How are the crabs? I mean that like your pets. She's going to stroke the, the crabs that she wears on her shoulders and just kind of nod at him and then give him a sea urchin. Oh, perfect. <laughs> That's delicious. Did you know sea urchins are extremely valuable? Like the, the gonads, they taste amazing. I've never developed a taste for it. It always seems like slimy backwash. Uh, you know, to each their own, right? It's all good. Um, hey, sleep. speaking of slimy backwash, uh, we got a little bit of a problem here. I, and I, uh, I was hoping to uh, ask my esteemed professionals if you might be able to uh, assist. Well, I suppose we've got a day or two. The uh, ship is being unloaded, and then we need to 
you know, put some stores on board for the the few things we can't get in in Rock's Hold. For example, uh, new editions of my latest book. <laughs> oh, it's selling out already. Uh, well, uh, yes, a, um, mm, yes. Let, a big let's not talk about how the sales are doing at the moment. That's all right. The sales that you worry more about are the ones in the ship, right? <laughs> Listen, listen, and, and Claude kind of, Claude has sort of really long, like preternaturally long fingers. So when he goes to crack his knuckles, there's like, there's like a third crack involved in that. So he <laughs> cracks his knuckles, goes, guys, um, we got a little bit of problem here. One that uh, I think you have a unique skill set that might be able to, uh, to assess. Um, you know, these battle crabs we got, right? Like our festival of shimmering waters. Harna's eyes kind of light up a little bit. Yeah, it's Ahana. You know what those things are all about, right? But um, have you noticed that? Wait, is this your first time here, or have you seen them before? Oh, Dharna's lived here for for years. She's she's all yeah. about this. Okay, so you know, um, some of the new people here may may not have noticed this, but uh, the numbers are down a lot. You know, the the new people maybe not so much, right? Because like the first time they come to it, that's just what they assume that's going to be. Right. So like, that's what they figured. That's how many battle crabs is going to be. But, you know, we people who are in the know, we've noticed that those numbers have been dropping, uh, you know, over the past couple of years, uh, you know, uh, our, and so uh, we're, we're wondering a little bit about what's causing that, because, you know, there's still a couple of them out there and, you know, the, the, the fun can go on, but um you know, I got two parts of concern. The first of all is like, obviously I don't want those species to go away. I like them. They're, they're fun. You know, you can like have a beer with them. It's a good time. Uh, the other thing though, is, uh, you mean, look around the joints hopping, the fog and wraith usually don't got so many people in it, but today, look, it's rocking. And the reason why is because we got so many people coming to visit, you know, they splash, they get the, the visible wounds get healed, right? They feel good. They're like spiritually renewed. It's all good. And they bring a lot of money and we need the money, right? Like taxes, et cetera, right? Um, people uh, are able to support cultural institutions like our fine AM and H here we got here. They're able to, you know, go to the market, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but they ain't no crabs, ain't no money. Uh, so I, th I, uh, I, I was, I was uh, talking to uh, Balanoftra the other day, and she was like, "You clock." I was like, "Well, hello there, region. It's nice to meet you." She said, "I know it is, although we've met before." And I said, "Well, please excuse me. Sorry, I'm running away with the mouth here." Anyway, TLDR, clock. She said, "Clog." We got to figure out what's up with the battle crabs here. Uh, excuse me, Travis. I have seemed to have forgotten what the actual name of the battle crabs are, but I'm gonna just call them battle crabs for now. Uh, so she said the uh, the battle crabs, uh, the populations look to be declining, and uh, she's not sure if there's some sort of nefarious reason for that or if it's natural population variation. Um, and she needed a group that was uh, how do we say scientifically adept but also morally questionable in case things have to be taken care of. And I said, oh, do I know the group for you? So here we are. Guys, we have to help those crabs. Are we sure that these populations are declining? I mean, I've been going to the festival for the last two or three years and there's plenty. It's like the streets are overrun. My personal anecdotal evidence suggests not. Well, I mean, you, the thing is, like, your, your baseline, if you will, uh, has been set to a particular place in time. But if the previous baseline, if you will, was much higher, then what you have is your baseline has been shifted away. And so you don't even recognize how, how pitiful it is out there. We used to have crabs all over the place. Couldn't even take a, couldn't even go for a swim without stepping on them. It's like, uh, it's like the going, you, 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 it was weird. You like put your foot in and you feel stuff squiggling around on you. Was, uh, but no, it was, it was good. It was good. It was a little discontinued, a little unnerving, but largely good. It was magic. Yeah, it, always, it is magic, right? I had this rash and I took a bath and it's gone. Don't you just hate shifting baselines, you know? It happens to all of us as we get older. 
Yeah, it's true. It's true. We're lucky to get older too, especially you guys with the adventures you've been having with the things with the whatnot and the thing that's shooting the things out of the mouth. Oh, that was scary. Uh, okay. but yeah. Shall we to adventure? Yeah, um, I think, uh, well, I mean, how do you want to approach this? Like Balanopter was as much as I uh, approve of her governing style, she was a little ambiguous on the specifics. So I don't know. I, mean, I guess the first thing to do would probably be to go and take a survey, like figure out how many we got. Maybe talk to people about how many they used to be. I don't know. What do you all think? So I like to think, oh, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm having a bit of a brain fart. Just a moment. There we go. Okay. So, Clog knows from the biologist that works for the AMNH, Limulus, that the numbers have been on steady decline, and he has data for that. He also knows that the battle crabs are... We, we don't know why they're declining. We just know that they are declining at the moment. We know enough data that it's definitely a shifting baseline. The question is, what are we going to do about it? And at the moment, Clog knows that there is something happening, but he doesn't know where that information is or where that something is coming from. And so right now, your options really to investigate this is not necessarily surveying the crabs. You have that data. It's oh, trying to discern okay. what is going on. Your options really are to try and figure out what possible opportunities there would be for the decline in the crabs. So we know that we could it could either be natural or it could be anthropogenic. So naturally caused or human caused. The question is, which route do you want to take? Because one will involve Going, to the, going out and doing some biological surveying. The other one will involve some mystery-based investigation. Yeah, so uh, apparently I was in error. I do know several things that might be of, of aid to people. Uh, first and foremost, the numbers are definitely declining. Thank you very much, Angelus. Uh, and uh, secondly, it's, uh, you know, we're up to deciding whether uh, those numbers are part of a natural fluctuation, if you will, a cyclical pattern of ups and downs and ups and downs, or, uh, you know, if there's shenanigans going on. And believe me, I lived in Aranax for four or five years now, it's probably shenanigans. So uh, I think we should probably go, go down to the bay and see if we might be able to uh, investigate some, uh, dare I say, point sources uh, for the shenanigans, uh, maybe some pollution, maybe some uh, over harvesting we'll go see what what uh what's what's shaken plus we get to go to the beach what's wrong to the that? beach to the beach yeah that sounds a jolly good idea let's head down to the bay and uh you know i i have this sort of rash that's uh, uh appeared so maybe i'll just go for a, a quick swim yeah I, you know, definitely can't hurt with that all right to the beach okay so lucian I would like you to make the first roll of the night, please. And please roll a... I'll go with intelligence roll. Oh, straight intelligence. Yep. Eek. That is a but 11. Okay. Aaron, I'm also going to get you to roll a straight wisdom roll for me. Oh, thank goodness. I was worried it was going to be intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> The heart does not go in for that book learning. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that is also not good. Also at 11. Okay. Lucian, you seem to recall Callie was setting something up in the city, um, some sort of like benevolent mafia where they were providing services to the downtrodden. Maybe it might be a good place to start for your investigation. Darhana, you seem to remember the name... It's, it's evading you, but there was a fisherman that you knew that used to specialize in crab fishing. You can't remember exactly the person, but maybe with a little bit of extra help, you might be able to find the person and they might be able to help you out, figuring out what's going on with these battle crabs. Yes. Um, yeah, Callie has that uh, sort of network of 
young orphans and such like. Uh, I wonder if they've heard anything about what's going on with the crabs. They might know, for example, if there's some sort of secret underworld illegal fishery going on of the battle crabs. Uh, yeah. Maybe we should just pop in there quickly. <laughs> From one type of urchin to another. <laughs> I crack myself up. That doesn't work. We can always check out the docks. There's some crab fishers we could we could check out. Uh, oh, edulous that. humor. Ahar, ahar. I just want to point out that I am so grateful for mute buttons right now. I'm just dying in the background here. So shall we uh, go to the docks and see if we can find some of the small scamps on the way? Oh, there's always a couple of the youngsters hanging around in the docks. Yes, I think it's a jolly good idea. Uh, I, I do have some of these uh, toffees that we can use as a barter for information. Children don't like toffees. They like fiddler crabs. And Tarn's going to hold, like, pouring over fiddler crabs. Edgeless is speechless. That, that's probably good. Darn is fairly certain in herself. True or not. So I think we're looking for children. You know what? All right, uh, folks. Yeah, let's let's oh. go down to the docks and uh, and check it out. Wait, no, docks are the the... Callie's place. I think we're starting with Callie's place. Okay, Callie's place. All right, so uh, let's go over there. Um, I know the owner. He owes me a favor. We rescued his hamster not too long ago. It was a giant hamster, so it wasn't a, a trivial task. Um, and I got a, a good crew of people over there who might be able to, uh, to know things. All right, so you head on over to Callie's sort of central uh, command post, I guess you would call it, or, or central bureaucracy of where everything is organized and run. It's a well-moving administrative machine, which is not what you would normally see in an NGO. So you're really excited to see things moving forward. Clog knows a fellow there by the name of Shekels. And Shekels is another goblin. And he helps look after some of the orphan-based stuff for Callie's uh, association of helping the downtrodden, we will call it for now. Uh, the and actual, so, the, the, the canonical name for that, if I can uh, harken back, would be the Plumbers Guild Benevolent Association Clubhouse. So there you go. There it is. We're going to the Plumbers Guild Benevolent Club. Association Clubhouse. Benevolent Association Clubhouse. The Plumbers Guild Benevolent Association Club. It Clubhouse. just rolls off the tongue. I don't know why anybody would have decided any other name to call it than that and then have to go look at old Google Docs to be able to remember what one called it a couple months ago. Oh, right. <laughs> Fascinating. So you head on over and you meet up with Shekels. And Shekels is sitting at the edge of a table, scrawling some numbers. And uh, he turns and he sees you and Clog and he goes, Clog, hey, buddy, how's it going? Shekels, how you doing, you old green booger? Uh, you know, not so bad. Definitely as good as your face. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm sorry to hear that. I got a face made for uh, sending messages. Uh, hey, Shex, my boy, we got, some, we got some questions to ask. You know those uh, battle crabs? Yeah, yeah, the shimmin' and waters, it's a good time. Got Last. rid of a rash a while ago. Oh, tell me about it. Um, yo, uh, do you know anybody who might be um, selling those things or, 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 or taking them out, maybe plucking them up for their own private shimmering waters? There's, there's like, the numbers are going down and we're trying to figure out what's going on. So you, uh, do you, know, uh, you are a guy who knows many a guy. So I'm asking a guy who knows a guy. It, from time to time, I do know a guy or two. Uh, you, you know, it's funny. M most of the most of the guys around here they don't they don't fish for them because there's no meat on them. So I don't know who'd be after that. But I do know who you can talk to about crab fishing, and that's Bobby Riggins. Bobby Riggins is the crab fishing expert around here. He knows everybody and anything that goes on with fishing for crabs. So if you think 
you have a crab question? That's the guy to go. You go talk to Bobby Riggins. Robbie Biggins. I got it. Darhana, when you hear the name Bobby Riggins, you get a flash of insight and you realize that's the guy you were looking for. You knew you know him. him. Yeah, you know him. This is this is the guy. And he's fished around your your kelp forest before. And he was actually quite respectful and actually stayed out of the area that you call your that you set up as no take. And uh, and so you kind of like him. He's a pretty honest guy. All right, guys, follow me and I'll start marching off to the, the docks to find him. I'm going to give uh, Shekels, uh, I don't know, a couple silver and uh, um, some jerky and say, Shex, keep it up, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Clog. Oh, this is the good stuff, too. This is that fine jerky. Oh, I haven't had a good meal since Tuesday. Oh, what? oh, this is yeah, great. You got you to scavenge those plates a little better. Anyway, Robbie Biggins, let's go. See you later. Okay, so you begin your trek down towards the docks, and you know that Aranax is a big port city, and it has several areas of docks. And you remember that he is in the Chandler's district of the docks, and he is found on Pier 15. That's the that's the Chandler's district. This is a merchant district, and it is full of people for outfitting and rigging ships. It is a very high-end chunk of the docks. Like, this is where shipbuilders go to buy supplies. This is where the sort of higher-end and rich people of the docks district do all their business. So you get up there, and you see all these big, fancy shops that are lining this big pier, and ships that are just everywhere. And it's just beautiful and gorgeous as far as a dock goes. And about halfway down the dock on the right-hand side is a more humble building compared to the rest of them. And it's got a handwritten sign and a crab carved into the top, the bottom of the sign, sort of flapping a little bit in the breeze. And on the sign, it reads, uh, Riggins Crab Riggins. And so you're, you know where you are now. What are you going to do? Uh, Daharna, since she knows this guy, is just going to walk up and push to the door without knocking. The door opens without too much hesitation. and You hear the little dingle of a shop bell. Ding, ding, ding. And uh, then someone from behind the counter sort of gets up off a, ta- off a, a stool and goes, oh. And he looks at the works of you and goes, oh, Dahana, what do you have me, ducky? Haven't seen you in forever. How's you been? How's your mother? How's your father? Oh, same, same. And she's she's gonna give him a, a handshake and uh, a starfish. That's it. Oh. So we're actually here um, about the crabs. Well, if you want, if you want. Crab gear, eyes the guy that builds the builds the traps, and eyes the guy that fishes them. Tell us what you know, crab man. <laughs> About what there? About the crabs, the obviously. Is why why are these crabs in decline? Who's who's taking them? You're clearly not because you're uh, you're obviously fishing sustainably and properly and. Uh, not catching crabs in areas that you're not supposed to be catching crabs, but where might they be disappearing to? Uh, uh, my bodies, I have no ideas what you're talking about. I, I sell gear now. I'm not after fishing crabs for a very long time. And on top of that, you realize that there's more than one species in these waters. You're going to have to be more specific there, buddy. Mm-hmm. I, I wonder if you could help us, perhaps... One way of finding out who's taking the crabs is to take one and attach some sort of, I don't know, magical sensor device, you know, sort of tag something onto it so we know where that crab goes if someone steals it or illegally fishes it. Well, you're going to make could the just crab ask the crabs. Dog? Sorry, Donna, what's that? I said we could just literally ask the crabs. We, we have speak with animals. 
Oh, I totally forgot you could talk to the animals. Why did we think of that before? Well, it's so much easier to find out how they behave and their their ecology if you could just talk to them. Why are you doing this behavior? Uh, I don't know if you guys food? have talked to crabs, but they aren't that bright. Uh, I love them, but they're they're simple. Just, just yes. a quick question to our buddies before you get all gibbledy gobbledy on me here. No offense, meant Dirk Clog, but which crabs are you talking about? The battle crabs. Oh, geez, now that helps. What she wants to know. Well, the numbers, they've been going down. And uh, we know you are a man who's in the know, word on the street. You might be able to tell us if uh, somebody's been, uh, you know, slinging battle crabs on the side. You know, it's funny you should ask me there, by. This is what I knows. I don't know. I know somebody's been after trying to fish and form because some feller came in here a while back and he's after asking me to make traps for these battle crabs. And I said, I said, son, why are you after that? They got snow meat on them. They're not good for feeding. The only thing they're best for kind for is, is when we get after them in the, in the shimmer and festival and people go out and swim in the waters, get all cured up and feel better. And well, buddy wasn't having it. He said he figured he had a good idea. Looked a little bit like a smart guy. Maybe he was working for the university. I don't know. But I mean, I I told him, you know, don't bother with it. They they are they burrow under the under the sand. You're gonna have to either dredge for them or you're gonna have to dive for them. And and he said, okay, thank you. And and he walked away. Didn't get didn't get a name though, but. He did leave. He did leave an address for me to to ship some supplies to him for for picking and dredging. Uh, I like I says, boys. I haven't I haven't fished for in years, but I still makes a good living after selling the gear. So I'll just you know try my best there. Uh, I got so I got some address if you needs it. Yeah, well, you wouldn't mind uh, sharing that, would you? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, he never told me it was to be a kept secret or somewhere. You don't have you, the, uh, you don't by any chance have the ability to uh, make your visage reflect that of this uh, the the gentleman in question by any chance, do you? Oh no, boy, I'm not the kind of guy that knows how to how how to describe. I'd say he's probably oh give or take oh jeez maybe 10 stone and uh and oh wow not too tall maybe bipedal just the two eyes oh yeah as, yeah human guy human guy two Any eyes no weird stuff features. well yes I mean, human that narrows it down really well narrow, yes yeah. Yeah. Well, probably about three and a half stroll. cubits high yeah 10 stone no no quarry you mm, said yeah. he was made out of stone. I mean, I feel like that <laughs> narrows it down, guys. No, right? no, by stone. It's, it's a way to measure. He's ten boulders glued together. <laughs> He's he, what's the thing? I always say it's a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a fortnight in pounds. Yeah, yeah. There you go. A stone is fourteen pounds, and so he'd buy, I'd say, one hundred and forty pounds if I had to do the math off the top of my head. Does maybe, anybody know comprehend? Maybe five foot tall. <laughs> <laughs> The hell is this guy talking about? What what oh, is the official? Just kind unit? of start pushing towards the door and be like, "Thank you so much, buddy. We really owe you one." What I is the best official? Kind, best kind, me ducky. Have a good <laughs> night. Oh, <laughs> what is the official unit of measurement in Aranax? Oh, not a stone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, where I come from, we measure thing in souls, uh, <laughs> eternal and and le levels of torment. So I don't know what it is here around here. Is that better or worse than the metric system? <laughs> Certainly closer to stones and pounds, <laughs> I think. It's got to be better than uh, imperial. <laughs> Wait, is there like so? There's there's a there's like an actual kilogram. Like there, it's like locked in a vault, and that is the it's like the type specimen of a kilogram. Is there a a rock somewhere that is the type specimen for a stone? Sorry, I'm like, I'm actually slipping into my clog voice because I'm so <laughs> dumbfounded by the fact that like a random piece of geological erupta is considered a way to measurement here. 
Well, uh, originally it was pounds, as in a pound of silver, a pound sterling, um, and that goes back to um, that goes back to the 1100s. And King Henry II, if you want to know, who standardised uh, coin making in the UK. So there you go. Okay, but so there is no type specimen for a stone. Like, there's not like some piece of granite locked away in an Ottawa vault that is like the default <laughs> for how much a stone weighs, right? So honestly, like there is this thing in biblical law where it's against carrying a diverse weights of large and small and literally is translated to you shall not carry a stone and a stone, a large and a small. Um, at that point, there was no standardized stone, but like once Darius came in and, and Romans kind of, you know, got into control from what I understand, there was more of a u- unit of measurement that was a stone, but it wasn't until like Great Britain that I think it was um, Weights and Measures Act of, I'm forgetting the year. You can uh, make a number up and I would not know the difference. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us on our Weights and Measures of European yeah. History podcast. In, in the Middle Ages, they did have people who would carry around the official weights yeah. to various different places and then compare them. And they would find out, the sort of local sheriff would find out whether or not people have been shaving off their weights. The local you know, they sheriff have would to find give out, out if people much. weighed more or less than a duck. To <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pop in here because I pulled up the Wikipedia uh, article. <laughs> oh, right. Um, we have the internet. <laughs> yes. Um, apparently, there is such thing as a metric stone in the Netherlands. Oh, Christ. Um, <laughs> adapted. Is it like 100 uh, Mesa pebbles or something? So, yeah. Apparently, in 1817, when they adopted the metric system, they made up a specific metric measurement for the, for the stone. Um, and, and it's defined as, oh my God, hold on, wait, reading, reading, reading. Um, a large rock. Yeah, it said uh, pounds of equal to a kilogram and a seam stone would be eight. So it's defined as, it's basically three, uh, three kilograms. <laughs> I think in Aranax, the, the measurement should actually be a very small stone golem. He was able to walk between different markets and then be the like sort of on a scale. The official All right, stone. Cool. So the people that <laughs> are on the scale, like players, <laughs> we fully go off the rails like this often. And if you listen to the podcast, we usually cut it out for your your listening pleasure. But welcome to. But if you're a Patreon, you can hear the extra content. <laughs> hear <laughs> us talk about about units of measurement and other random stuff. By the way, your door was made your... out of stone today, apparently. <laughs> By the way, talking about talking, horseshoe crabs don't actually have jaws because the way they eat, they have these special structures in their armpits. And they sort of eat by sort of grinding their armpits together. God, I wish so I could, give I, that right could we could we actually speak to them or were they just sort of That's an excellent armpits question. Armpits grind at well, us. TBD. TBD. Um, You'll have to find out when we get there. Uh, yeah. We get there. Travis, what's the address? The address is Pier 2 in that. the fishing district. No, this is, I love this. <laughs> I was I was about to even chime in and make it worse and be like, leave it to the Dutch to, you know, color their flag with whale poop and make a metric rock. So <laughs> true. So I assume this gentleman is what we're searching for is in the Lyceum. Is that you, correct? You you've left the store. Clog has the address written down on a piece of paper. Oh. Building 15 on Pier 2 in the fisherman's end of the piers. To and the so Clog hasn't revealed that yet. Uh, ahead, yeah, to the fisherman's end of the piers. Here's the address. Why don't we copy it down in case I, um, you know, use this as a napkin or something like that. I, I wouldn't put it past me to do that, too. Uh, let me see. What, uh, what's your name? Uh, Edulis. You got a good looking mustache. You must be smart. Why don't you keep a ta- uh, track of this? Oh, I will certainly not forget this or misplace it. All right. Building 15, pier number two, Fisherman's District. Adventure Building awaits. Building two, pier 15. What? Fisherman's District, Adventure awaits. 
Adventure. Thank you. That's what I was waiting for. Uh, we would like to go to um, building 15 on pier number two. Wait, I thought it was. No, you're right. <laughs> Wrong. You got to look at it the other way around. All right, so you start making your way down to the fisherman's district, and you merrily trundle your way along. Here we and go. along the way, you in. finally get to pier number two. And the buildings are numbered from closest to the dock, or sorry, closest to the pier and out. And you know that building 15 should be about eh, near, near the end, because there's only about 20 buildings uh, on each pier. So you make your turn on the, onto the dock, and this is very much the fishing district. It is starting to have that waft of low tide and lots and lots of fish. There's a, there's a, a cone of cold plants along the side where they keep things frozen. And you've got some, some necromancers that are hired specifically to chill touch dead fish and gentle repose them to keep them fresh. But that doesn't necessarily prevent the guts from 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 getting fresh and they have these huge tubs of fish guts that uh they ferment and it creates a substance that they call marig and marig is uh is kind of like the the ketchup of of the fisherman's district and it's it's <laughs> it's a very acquired taste but aranaxians love this stuff you guys are having to like hold clog back by his shoulders because he wants some Merig really, really badly. It's so, garum. Yeah, it's this, this stuff was exported throughout the Roman Empire. They've even found traces of it up in Scotland. What's the real world name for the thing? Garum. Garum. garum? Romans garum? were obsessed with it. Yeah. It was the ketchup of the Roman era, fermented fish guts. I feel like the ketchup of the non-Roman era is uh, dramatically uh, a dramatic improvement over that. Yeah, he tried making it on a tasting history, and that was the the conclusion. Oh. <laughs> However, as a goblin and a plumber, I feel like I would be all over this stuff. As a matter of fact, I'm probably smearing the address because I'm wiping my face with uh, with the, uh, uh, the the what is it, fish ketchup? It sounds oh, it sounds atrocious. Hmm, you're actually smelling uh, a lot better, Clog. I would bathe in this stuff if city ordinances allowed it. And you're just going to town. You're having such a good time. And it's like, it's just hit that perfection of fermented where it's fresh and it hasn't aged too much. And oh, you can taste just the sweetest hint of whatever was left over in a pyloric cecum. Yeah, and it like, it's, like it's up in your sinuses and, and lingers there for a couple of days. So if you ever want to go, and you can just like, oh, yeah, that's round two. Do they also have the fermented basking shark as well? Oh, because basking sharks have a high level of urea in their tissue. So when they ferment, that urea, urea transforms into ammonia. So it has this really... That's what you got with the fish ketchup on it for. <laughs> they, do you have, they do have a bit of that. It's a bit of a, a an Aranaxian delicacy, which they call harlech. And it is a fermented large shark. And so what they do is they take the sharks and they will put them, they gut them, and then they bury them in the dirt for about a year, haul them up, and the thin flesh on the outsides of the gutting and then the thicker flesh is peeled to reveal a pure white meat that is uh, made of terror and bad decisions, but is everyone loves it. And it's got this pungent aroma of onions and fish and pain, but they eat it like it's chili peppers. And it's this contest to see who can eat the most of it. But because Aranax came when it was founded, it was a bit of a poorer community. This was a big deal, and it was a, a very traditional food. So they ate that with uh, much of the spirits that they brew in the area, which is, is infused with caraway, which makes it this bitter, fiery, licorice-y stuff. Travis, I would like fun. to use my sleight of hand ability to try to steal some rotten shark. You absolutely managed to do that. No one is paying attention. It is everywhere because it's a packing district, not a not a sales district so you managed to get yourself 
a great big handful and it's just again <laughs> the clog it's heaven yeah i'm gonna just, try to go into really, town i'm gonna try to speak really closely to people from now on <laughs> and use a lot of you're energy. going to limit your social distance yeah as a, no come here come here i i i, I gotta tell you something tell a lot of secrets <laughs> amazing uh anyway let us let us stop sidetracking the adventure with the delicacies building 15 my dear friend yeah what is it the other th- you, as yeah blah, 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 blah. okay so as you're going shark. along one other interesting thing is with the with the large shark fishery for the basking sharks they actually have a processing facility for the livers and the reason why they have the processing facility for the livers is because the oil that comes out of the livers is used in high quality machining parts. So any of the metal work uses is a cutting oil and a lubricating oil. And so it's a really active fishery in this part of Aranax. And uh, it is one that has come under question by the regents and the biologists of the MNH as being a sustainable fishery or not. And so it's one of those ones that they're trying to question. Question. You know, I, I blame these artificers that have suddenly appeared over the last couple of years. I mean, they, they use tons of that oil stuff for their mechanical devices. Question. Is this oil combustible? Not in the traditional sense. It's actually Ooh. a really high heat capacity oil. It's one of the reasons why they use it is because it can mm. lubricate things that are undergoing intense heat. I bet you if you break a wizard staff, it'd blow up. <laughs> <laughs> we're never gonna live sort that of, down some sort of power staff i'm not <laughs> sure really useful kind of staff just pedulous was misled in the moment it seemed like a good idea <laughs> okay so after you get past to play with after you get past all of the fisheries and stuff for the large fish you manage to make it to the end of the dock and at the end of the dock you see a medium-sized warehouse with large double doors in the front, a side entrance, and a walkway along the edge of the building with a skirt wharf where a ship is tied up called the Bathonomus. And this above the doorways at the front of the building, you have the number 15. You are here. What would you like to do? Bathonomus, that means deep gnome, doesn't it? Yeah, I think there was uh, the gnomes built a little sphere uh, and then they 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 dropped it off, um, but they forgot to put a cord on it. So <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> bathos sink. Uh, <laughs> Angelus walks up to the door and bangs loudly. Oh, buddy, buddy, have you ever heard of the stealth approach? Crab here, man, here, let we me are know. here. Darn is also going to bang on the door. Tell us about the crabs. Oh. We want to know about the crabs. Oh, these. Oh, all right. There is no answer. Mm. I look through the window surreptitiously. There is no window per se, but you can get kind of a look through the crack of the main double doors. You can't really make out much, but you hear sort of a shuffling and scuttling. And odd, every once in a while, you hear a clink of a glass bottle. Would you like to check the door and see if it's open? Uh, let me just, are there any other points of egress or uh, of, for the building? Is this a one-way trip? Uh, well, you haven't looked around the back side of the building. There is, the, there is the, the skirt wharf that goes along the edge. There is the... Uh, side entrance which is just like so envision like a big warehouse with a big set of double doors for like rolling in a boat or a truck and yeah. then there's the little door that's built for a human next to it i must admit some degree of uh naval naval ignorance here i am not sure what a skirt wharf is uh i so, assume it has nothing to do with the lady's garment so a wharf is a man-made structure that is utilized for the temporary binding or um uh, what is it? Harboring of ships. A skirt wharf is one that goes along an edge of a cove or wharf, or sorry, a cove or other man-made structure. So a, sticking a pier out, wharf. Sort of like, yeah, it kind of like, rolls along right. and ships butt up along the side of it. As opposed to pier, where they 
where it sticks way out in the water and they come up along the edge of it. Okay, but this is the more dwarf a... is a large Klingon warrior. <laughs> <laughs> Filled with honor. Mm-hmm. Filled with honor. <laughs> but, but this isn't one of those. This is one of those butt wharfs, right? Yeah, it's a butt wharf. <laughs> What's a butt wharf? Uh, we are the worst. Oh dear. Edgeless tries to open the door. The door appears to be locked. Edgeless tries it again. <laughs> How are you yes, gonna try? Can we, can we like scooch around and see if there's other things like we might instead of just you know adventure abounds and all that stuff, but maybe take a look at what's going on in there. Are, are you able to pick the lock possibly? I am. I just don't think that's the proper course of action at this point in time. This is a door I, that must be respected. I, I, I could cut it open with my flaming sword. But listen, listen. Tall and wearing tights. It's okay. Just give me 30 seconds to what we call professionally in the business, case the joint. Uh, fine. Travis, I would like to case the joint. All right, you take a walk around the pier. You notice that on the side of the building from about 25 feet up, because this is a fairly tall building, there are a series of pane windows that are letting sun in near the roof, acting sort of like a skylight. As you go around the backside, there is another giant set of double doors where the skirt wharf parts. And it's obvious that this is allows ships to to sort of be pushed back in so that they can load sort of like a dry dock. And next to that, on your side, there is another door. Okay, I, I uh, share that information with my fellows and suggest that uh, maybe we go up the windows. You're not going to check the other door if it's, see if it's locked or anything? I want to get a look first. Okay. Yeah, that'll be to... too obvious to go through the unlocked door. I have two I have, doors? I have what sort of doors. place has two doors? <laughs> <laughs> What are they hiding? Well, while Clog is shitting up a rain pipe uh, to look in the shitting, windows. please. That's a very different verb. <laughs> uh, I am just going to see if the door is unlocked. So the rear door appears to be unlocked and you open it and push it open a crack. Or are you going to go inside? Oh, I will um, go inside because it'll be very amusing to meet Clog at the top after he's crawled up the side of the building. But before you Whatever, do, I got a 25 cast... foot crawl and speak. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before you do, I'm just going to cast uh, Check for Traps real quick. Okay. Because I, I was looking at my spells and I do have that. Okay. You find no traps on the door. Okay, perfect. Mm-hmm. All right. So you enter. Lucian, you enter a room filled with racks upon racks of Phacopodius, the battle crab. They are tied with their dorsal ventral side up and head pointing towards the sky on a 45 degree angle. Their telson's pointed downward and cut at the end. Their blood is dripping into gallon sized alchemical bottles. As each bottle fills, an unseen force replaces the full bottle with an empty one and takes the full bottle to a storage rack at the far end of the building. There are no other people in the room other than yourself. Oh, it reminds me of my mother's workroom, but with crabs. This is like the horseshoe crab blood harvesting stuff, right? Like, is the blood blue? We're not all in there yet. Sorry. We all go in and also see this. All right, so you're all summarily horrified. Yep. Yeah. What the flirk is this all about? Can, can Dahana start unhitching crabs? Are they savable? You look through most of them, and it doesn't look like many are savable. They're they're being the unseen forces are taking them off as they stop moving around. Usually, you see that the dripping will happen for a while, and then motion stops and it's done um the crabs are kind of thrown into a bucket to one side uh and there's also a large tank on one corner of the building that's filled with them and uh it looks like kind of like a giant brewing vat it's got a uh 
is this big tank. It's got some glass windows in it. So you can tell what it is. It's full. And there is a, um, one of those uh, locking wheel mechanisms that would allow you to open the door to that. And it would rush all the water out into the, into the sea and the contents would spill in as well. Darn is like right for that tank. Yeah, what let's is, do that. What is the, you said there's like unseen servants or something that's actually- Yeah, manipulated. some sort of invisible force. You don't know what it is, but it seems to be moving bottles and picking up crabs from a tank and mounting them on the rack. Uh, you see a pair of scissors or shears and they snip the end of their telson, which is the long pointed tail and they uh, tie it to the end of a bottle and it starts dripping in. It's like some horrific maple syrup factory, but the liquid in the bottles is very much blue. Bright blue? Bright can, we blue. Talk to, can we talk about the science here real quick about like horseshoe crab blood and, and like what that's used for? Absolutely. This is actually why I made this particular adventure. So horseshoe crab blood from the Atlantic horseshoe crab in real life is blue. And the reason why it's blue is because it's filled with a protein called hemocyanin. So in humans, we have hemoglobin, it contains iron, it makes our blood red. And in these particular crabs, hemocyanin makes their blood blue because it contains copper. Now, the amazing thing about this blood is that it was a it's got a protein in it, an enzyme in particular, called limulus clotting factor C. Now, limulus clotting factor is a special immune response protein that has been found in, in these crabs that creates a jelly cocoon around gram positive or sorry, gram negative bacteria. So they use it as a way to test vaccines and this is how they do it. So originally vaccines were tested for bacterial contamination, because if you get stabbed with a vaccine that's got bacteria in it, well, that fresh, virulent, uh, like very bad bacteria is in your bloodstream. It hits a sensitive organ and you don't live very, very long. So they needed a way to be able to test them. And so what they originally did is they did animal testing and they would use rabbits. And so they would take a batch of vaccine, they would inject it into a bunch of rabbits and monitor them for sickness. If any of them got sick, they would throw the vaccine out and start over because it was contaminated. Now, the... Limulus clotting factor C could be turned into a product called Limulus amoebocyte lysate, LAL. And LAL can then be put into samples of vaccine and it will cause the vaccine sample to go cloudy if there is bacterial contamination in it, saving rabbits from a lot of very bad days. Now, in real life, they became overfished as a result of it. And so that's what uh, we have on the go here, just with a different species. Just for numbers, roughly like about half a million to a million horseshoe crabs are captured and bled alive for this process every year. Like, And about they drain about 30% of the blood. And of those 30%, 30% of the drained ones don't survive the process. And the rest of them, the other 60% are returned to the ocean. And a lot of those ones that are returned to the ocean are in a very sort of morbid state and they don't survive the process. And it's been causing the actual horseshoe crab population on the East coast of the United States and Canada to dwindle by as much as 30% a year. And also things that, that feed off of that. So not to belabor this point, because we could be talking about obscure units of measurement. Um, but one of the things that um, is a, a follow-up in that is that the, the horseshoe crabs, when they, when they mass spawn, like in the, uh, the bay here, uh, that's an important source of food. And so things that rely on that, like the federally endangered red knot, which is a bird that flies basically from South America up to Alaska, um, those, those birds rely on um, stopover points like uh, the Jersey Shore, right? The, the Red Knop, it's a, it's a major source of migration there. And with the decline in horseshoe, popu horseshoe crab populations, um, we've seen a commensurate decrease in the Red Knop population. So there's whole ecosystem impacts to this, um, which Clog knows nothing about, but you, our listeners, can 
and get the, uh, the scoop on that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's a, uh, it's, it's a huge part of that ecosystem for a number of reasons beyond that. And uh, if you've not known much about horseshoe crabs, they're amazing and do a lot of ecosystem services. I highly recommend talking or listening to a researcher by the name of Wynn Watson, who's done huge amounts of work on that. Anyway, let's move on. So, so I would like to taste the blue liquid. It has a metallic tang and it makes you feel fantastic. Roll a D4. All right, let's see here. I got a one. So you feel like you have an extra temporary hit point. Hey, guys, this joy juice has got some buzz to it. But Do you not see the horror of what's happening? I would like to take one of the battle crabs and just sort of like slurp on it like an otter pop from when I was a kid. And Can incidentally, I roll, uh, the light blue tackle? ones. <laughs> the light blue ones were my favorite color. So, no, but not for the reasons that I don't want you to attack Clock. Uh, you are in the middle of a very sort of blinder tunnel vision moment of going to grab the handle on the big tank and set it free. That's you right. already you established that. So yeah. that's what you're doing. So if you want to roll an attack roll, you're attacking a door. Hmm. So I'll, I'll go try ahead. and open the door before I attack it. Yeah, um, so you go over and you twist on the thing and it's a bit stuck, so make a strength check. Yeah, I was going to help Tahana with uh, the wheel, but knowing unseen servants as I do, I'm going to try and deal with them and stop the, stop the bleeding process. So I'm going to use Eldritch Blasts to blast the unseen servants out of existence. Okay, you, you are doing that. You're shooting them out and you can sort of see them shimmering and then they fade away and it takes you about uh, i'd say there's probably 10 or 10 or 15 of them so let's say it takes you about a minute to get it all done uh darhana make a strength check uh 13 13 okay yeah so you manage to give it a good jerk and a reef and it twists and pops and as you open it all of a sudden, all the water pressure from this tank that's about 10 feet wide and 25 feet tall flops the door open and you need to make a reflex save. Uh, what, what kind of reflex save? Dex save, sorry. This is what happens when you've been playing D&D for so long. Stuff from older editions gets stuck in your head. Well, that was a nine. Could I possibly, um, oh. as a reaction, use my wings to block the water? Uh, not really. That's it fair. wouldn't help you very much. It doesn't really matter. You take two points of damage from the water buffeting you, and you get okay. pushed back five feet. As this deluge of water and crabs gets flushed out to sea. Okay. Meanwhile, so, Clog is just sucking on one of the crabs like a gusher. Oh, like yeah. an auto pop. Yeah. Or like a Capri Sun that, that wiggles, I guess. No, okay, no, so no. as you're dealing with this chaos, someone wanders in through the front door and charges down and looks at you and says, What are you doing with all of my crabs? You're ruining everything, you fools. What are you doing with all of the crabs? You're ruining everything. And he, uh, Edgeless, takes out his flaming sword. Can I, roll I know it roll doesn't look rather... I know it doesn't look rather pleasant. I'm trying to help people here. Don't you understand? This heals people. He may have a point, guys. Um, I only rolled a nine. And, and do you worth? know the effects of your actions on the crab population? Am I, am I understanding that right? That's what we're doing here? Yes, yes. The crab, unsustainable practices. Ah, yes. Not good. What was, sorry, uh, lots of stuff happened. Very funny stuff. Darhana, what were you rolling for? What was the so roll? Punch him in it? the face. Punch him in the face. Okay, so we're going to play that game. All right, folks, so this is where we actually go into a battle, and now I'm going to need everyone to roll initiative. 
That's brilliant. I'm very guy. upset at the, about the crabs. Nine. I got a Kraken on my metal Kraken oh. dice, brought to you by Kraken Dice. Kraken Dice. Let's get Kraken. Let's get Kraken. I got the total for 24, by the way. Just I got 15. Myself. Okay, let me write some of this down. Dahana, I have two words for you. Well, three words. Dire battle crab. Ah, oh, yes. The irony is palpable. I thought you were going to say okay. flying squid, which also would have been acceptable. So we got clog is a 15. Uh, Andrew. 24. 24. Uh, Aaron is a, or sorry, seven. not Aaron, Darhana is a seven. Got to get me a battle and, soda. Uh, Lucy and then Andrew went like five minutes ago. Nine. Nine. Okay. Um, and uh, Buddy McGee here. Buddy McGee. I, uh, I, that's what I just call everything. It, it's the uh, big bag evil guy. Uh, and he is uh, evil got evil. that, and so if you're a regular listener, go... this is what we edit out normally. All the bad math as we can't add up dice rolls and try to work out what it is that we're doing. Which is an important point when thinking about making products, right? So like you don't want to, um, <laughs> what you're about to witness, you may not necessarily want on a regular podcast. It's fun. Like I like the D and D part, but the like three plus six plus four is thirteen. Like that takes a little bit of uh, takes you out of it. Yeah, not everybody wants yeah. to know how the sausage is made, <clears throat> or the healing potions, as the case may be. Yeah. Uh, now, of course, my wizard uh, NPC that I was using is gone. Uh, oh, he's a wizard. Well, Good you don't know, know that yet. <laughs> Did did my attack land? Um, your attack Does didn't land because hard. we went to initiative. Um, but I will resolve it in a moment. Oh, that's so fine. Just give time. me, give me a quick second there. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna punch nice. his face in the face. And so if you're interested in doing your own sort of podcast, it's really, really worthwhile making sure you have uh, somebody who's willing to do the editing because um, this is a little, is, I mean, it's fine. I'm glad you guys are here, but you know, there's, if you've ever played D&D, &D, you know that there's a lot of times where, you know, four, like three minutes of battle could take you four hours to go through. And then you can just travel around a countryside for three days and 45 seconds, you know? So yeah. And then this you hit a door a, and it takes you two episodes. It's it's a thing. This is a very long way of saying we love you, Travis. Thank you for editing our episodes. Yeah, from experience, yes. a 45-minute episode can take sometimes six hours to edit. Yeah, it's a bit rough. Easily, yeah. So uh, I'm hoping to get through this battle and then we can, this will be the end of our, our little podcast, oh, the episode up. thing. So we're doing it. Uh, the order of attack is, is or initiative is as follows. Edulus, Clog, the big bag, evil guy, Lucian, and then Darhana. Darhana, because you threw a punch at him in a surprise round, you get the first attack. And you threw a punch at him, and nothing comes of it. It this seems to sort of fade off of a, an ethereal force that's around him. Like he has some sort of, some, some sort of, armor that is magical i hate to perhaps in ready. a mage's armor if you will i wonder what that could be it's a mystery a fancy okay. boy light him up and again he hollers out please don't don't do this i'm just trying to help then surrender and talk i ref you attacked me first this is not fair how about ye? Okay, a Andrew, so Edulus goes first. How far away is he? Uh, the building is only about um, 60 feet by 40 feet. It, it's, it's a smallish warehouse. But I, could, but I couldn't reach him just by running. Um, uh, 
Well, you could you could get to him in a move, and uh, I know so you could theoretically attack him. Yeah. Okay, I was just wondering if I, ha- I if I needed to use my misty step. Um, so Agilus runs towards him and swings at him twice with his flaming tongue scimitar. And he goes, "Oh no, stop! Roll your attack. Submit." That's a eighteen on the die and. A 12 on the die, and the 12 is plus 7, so 19 is the lowest one. Okay. Uh, you got to do two things for me. Roll your damage and roll a dex save. Good thing Edulus is very dexterous. All right, so that's plus 10 plus... Uh, Four plus so nineteen damage uh, from the fire sword, mm-hmm. uh, and the deck save is thirteen plus six, so nineteen. Okay, so you take half damage from the hellish rebuke, and it is um, uh, five points of damage that you take. Ah, a mere pittance of damage. Is that the best you can do? And then it is Clog's turn. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I've ever actually fought anybody with Clog before. I'm going to attack with my hand crossbow. That is going to be a um, 24 to hit. Mm -hmm. So... It looks like it would hit, but it seems to fade off of some sort of uh, of, of wall of of some of some sort that seems to be surrounding him, protecting him from arrows. What that mother? Uh, okay, I uh, I got nothing else then. Uh, I would like to make sure that everybody else is aware of the ongoing shenanigans. And uh, then I'm going to uh, hide as a bonus action. As is tradition. Do you need me to make a stealth check? Uh, yes, but only be, not because uh, it'll be difficult, because, just because you need to have at least something. Okay, it is a uh, 14, surprisingly low. You managed to tuck yourself into one of the racks where they had the battle crabs hanging up, and it looks like you've you feel like you're securely hidden. Yeah. Don't, don't goblins have some sort of like natural hiding ability or, or bonus or something like that? I don't know. I never I am, fight with this guy here. I'm assuming I, that, that he accounted for that. So, but that I, might make me a bad DM. I'm not sure. I think they have like a, a disengage and hide ability. Um, yeah. I, I can use disengage or hide as, I don't know why I'm reading this in Clog's voice, as a bonus action at the end of your turns. So I am yeah, using. So it's like being a rogue, but not being a rogue. Yeah, I'm using my. Also, don't forget Fury of the Small. You got you can do extra damage if you want to once per. I know, but I gotta hit it first. Then I'm going to Fury of the Small. Mm -hmm. Mm. I also was going to roll for sneak attack because I forgot that I'm not. I I, but I forgot I'm a ranger, not a rogue. So I got no sneak attack. Okay. Anyway. Mr. Uh, Diaper Face, I believe, is up next. Yes, he is up. He says, no, please, you don't understand. Help, officers, help. And then he poofs and disappears. Mother flurkin. Everyone roll perception checks. Okay. What do we got for this mother? That would be a seven. Five for Edulis. Hey, good looking at you guys. Hey, hey. Team. we're doing like the Spider Man thing. And I only got a 21. All right, <laughs> somebody's <laughs> capable in this party, and ain't me. It's the one thing Darn is really good at. You hear uh, like thundering footsteps running down the dock outside the building. She's believe- after him. Yeah, go after okay. him. All right, so we're dropping out of initiative now, and he's running toward, you can see him. He's probably a good 100 feet ahead of you. Can I throw a running. squid at him? <laughs> I don't know the range on a squid, but I'm going to say that this would put it at disadvantage. 
So okay, the the spell is Figgy's um exploding squid, and the range is oh, it's sixty feet. Okay, yeah. So the answer is no. I'm sorry. The answer is no. Eldritch blast would get him. Are are you chasing him too? Oh yes. Okay. Yeah, because so I got a point... I got an eighteen. Yeah. At this point, we're having a chase scene. I'm going to say that Lucian and Darhana heard it and burst out the door, and so you're going to be ahead of uh, Clog and edgeless by a round and you hear him screaming he's he's like help help officers officers i'm being accosted so what are we doing we're chasing him oh we're chasing him i'm just trying to decide if i want to do it as a giant crab yes yeah i i got a 21 and a 16 okay so with that you hit with one so where you go Uh, da, 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 da. that would be at uh, 12 points damage. Okay, perfect. Okay, now he gets, oh, I'm just kind of keeping it in pace here. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's gonna put um, Clog and I assume Clog and Edulus are running behind, so you're about 60 feet behind the other folks and uh he's about 100 feet ahead of you so he gets forward he gets stabbed blasted with an eldritch blast and you hear him scream louder and continue to run and continue to run and at the end of the dock he halts and there is a contingent of guards there that hold up their halberds and uh say halt cease this fighting this instant what business is going on here and then the, the wizard fellow, he hollers out and he says, My name is Charles Crankawaith, and I have permission to be fishing on these docks, and these ruffians have decided to attack me and emptied my fishing vessels. Arrest them. Arn is going to catch him. It's charm person. Ooh, nice charm call. person to the cops. Travis, you're muted. What's the charisma save on that, Chris? Chris, you're muted. Hey guys, it's a Zoom meeting. It is 16. Okay. And I'm casting it at fifth level, so I can charm lots and lots of people. Okay. Uh, there's 10 guards there. Um, I'm rolling for the captain, and then I'll roll for the rest of them, too. Okay. So the squadron fails and thinks that you're a good stand-up fellow. The sergeant at arms believes that the wizard has something, or the sorcerer fellow, Mr. Crankerwaith, is uh, telling the truth. And so the sergeant says, everyone put down their arms, right? No, I will not have this in my city. What appears to be the problem? We were hired by Bellinoptra. Thank yeah. you, Bellinoptra. I forget, Regent Bellinoptra, right? Yeah. We're like yeah, Regent to yeah. this. Thank you. We were hired by... <laughs> we were hired by Regent Bellinoptra to find out what is going on with the crab population. And this man is harvesting them in a diabolical method and reducing the population. We are just doing our jobs, good sir. Very nicely done. I give you a little tap on the butt. Thank you. Hello, tiny man. Darn is going to jab a finger and just start screaming, He's killing the crabs! I have license from the city in order to fish these crabs. Their blood is being harvested and turned into healing potions for the local infirmaries. Why, I understand that this is somewhat difficult for you to process, but I am trying to do a good deed for the city. Ask so please stop murdering me. 
Ask him if he's got an animal care protocol. I know they're invertebrates, but protocol? still. <laughs> I a cook. I a cook. I would imagine that Lucian from the university side of thing and the academia would be the one who could throw all this legal gobbledygook. Yeah, where's yeah, Lama? Well, the, the Ivory Lyceum is somewhat slapdash with their Iacuc procedure, uh, particularly since they were bought over by di big necromancy. So their, uh, let's just say their ethical research it leaves somewhat to be desired. <laughs> I'm only attempting to do good for the community. I understand that it might seem a little bit crass, but really all scientific discovery and alchemical discovery is at the end of a very long, dark kitchen. Please. I'm only trying to do good. Why, why would you at attempt to destroy my work? And when the crabs disappear? I have license to harvest 12 tons every month right now. And who did you get this license from, pray tell? Because I think Regent Balanoptera trumps whoever signed your license. Well, it was from the Ministry of Health and Alchemical Studies. Ah, that explains it. But I do it. understand that. that they've been bought over by big necromancy too. I bet you. Big potion. <laughs> Still, the fact remains that everything I am doing is legal, and you have lost me a great deal of money and time. What How about the I money and time that the festival brings in? It, the indirect socioeconomic benefits impacts everyone in Aranax. Think about all the money that's been spent by the tourists in the restaurants or the accommodation in the inns let alone the health benefits of swimming in the water for the, the local people. If you get your way, only people who can be able to buy the blood will get health benefits. Some sort, as opposed to, you know, sort of a social health care system. If people can just swim in the waters, I, available I, to everyone. I'm, I'm afraid I don't understand, old chap. Are you saying that there's trouble with these things down the line? Yes, yes, absolutely. You're fishing these crabs unsustainably and thereby reducing important resource for the local community, let alone the health benefits of swimming in the shimmering waters. Well, I didn't realize that was a thing. Be it as it may, I still have license for it. And so if you wish to take this up, I will continue my harvesting at a lower rate until you are able to determine the impacts of this and come up with a sustainable practice. Well, I, I think there should be uh, at least a cessation of the harvesting until we can do a proper scientific analysis to ensure what sustainable catch levels might be, and also a humane way of bleeding these animals. Can I do a persuasion roll? Yeah, we gotta be precautionary yeah. about this. Yeah. Can I assist him by summoning uh, a horde of battle crabs to come pouring up out of the, the water? <laughs> I will make sure there is a cessation until this is figured out. Uh, 24. 24 persuasion Damn. okay so there's murmurs from the back of the squadron they've all kind of put down their arms and like this sounds this sounds pretty legit uh sarge we we should we should probably listen to this guy this seems like i think he's he's real talking straight here he's kind of my friend we should we should definitely listen to him yes we should and definitely sergeant, do some some sort of marine environmental impact manuscript or the, the, something like that. The, the sergeant has having none of this. And he says, I'm not here to interpret the law. I am here to enforce it. And right now, he has legal precedent. And I understand that you have orders from Balanoptera. And as long as you can prove it, I'm happy to leave both sides to go. But at the end of the day, violence will not be tolerated. Uh, at this point in time, I would like to take out my orders from Balanoptera. 
and, uh, and reinforce the fact that we are working with eminent scientists at the Aranax Museum of Natural History to, uh, to understand these population declines. We are hither, hither on to following these orders uh, specifically as per they were done Magna Carta and there therefore I think we are entirely in the clear. And I'm gonna we try charm pursing it, use my second spell as a warlock Whoa, and charm personing the, the captain to get him on side. Okay, well, the captain like has a look at too. the orders and they have the right seal and he says, oh yeah, these are legit, these are legit. Okay, you both have rights to this. I'm going to let this violence slide, but no more of it. And right now he has license to actually work these docks as sits from the Ministry of Health and so you can't stop his fishing. And so as far as I'm concerned, you're going to have to take it up between yourselves. But if I see one more fight, y'all both going to the brig. Can we see this so-called license? And uh, then um, Crankerwave pipes up and says, yes, you may. It's on my boat, the Bathynomus, with my actual captain's room, if you so desire. But I'll be right is. back. I need to go sink a ship. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Please let's look at this. Not... Let's look at this permit to see whether or not it's bona fide. We just have your word for it, whereas we have bona fide paperwork here. Okay, so the guards disperse. Fighting has ceased. You all go back to his boat, and he reveals papers. The papers are legitimate but they're signed by one of the regents that uh, his name's evading me. It was the one that turned out to be um, doing time. Uh, that would be Reynolds. Yeah. So it was signed by Regent Reynolds because he was one of the people that was in charge of the ministry of health at the time. Oh, so technically the documents are legal, but how they came to be legal is questionable. So, so it's it's enforceable, but it was in, it was made by someone that probably shouldn't have actually had the chance uh, to sign them. It's it's like dolphin captures in the Dominican Republic, <laughs> where uh, they signed a permit to allow dolphin captures, but it actually contramanded the law because it was uh, somewhat dubious. So they yeah. introduced a, a temporary ban. Man, I um, wish Armo was here. <laughs> yes, this calls for a lawyer. And a temporary injunction. Uh, Edulis would like to see the papers closely to inspect them. Okay. Arna is yeah. sorely tempted to eat the papers and solve all of her problems. But... Edulis pulls out his flaming swords and sets it on fire! <laughs> I was just and... going to grab it and get a paper cut and give it a hellish rebuke. <laughs> Crank Crankerwave like looks at you. why would you do such a thing they keep those on record in the archives i can go get another which will take you time while we <laughs> do other things he was this not the right thing to do <laughs> friends i'm not a lawyer but he has no papers i i, I think it gives us a little bit of time at least to try and uh, try and contact Balanoptera and get some sort of temporary stoppage, whatever the legal term is. Yeah, so you I... tried to persuade him earlier, right? Right, Lucian? Yes. Yeah, and you did quite high. And so uh, at this point, Crankerwaith said, e enough, enough. I understand that this is a little bit over my head legally. My goodness, you are persistent. I will halt fishing for now, one fortnight, until you can figure out what it is that's going on. After the fortnight, I will go back to my business as usual because I am still trying to help people in the city. There was a shortage of healing cure at many of the town's infirmaries, and I devised this system to be able to help them. There's got to be a more sustainable way of doing this, though. I mean, you're, you're like, do, do you not notice how vampiric it appears? We've had vampire troubles before, and you're actually worse than those guys. 
Oh, says the person who was sucking on it like a bag of juice when I walked into my half-destroyed factory. I'm not a proud man. We've all made mistakes. <laughs> here, here, my good man, um, we, we don't want any bad feeling, and we want to be able to work with the fishing community to uh, bring about um, management procedures which uh, benefit everyone. So here, take, take uh, 10 platinum pieces. That should cover your expenses for a week or so until we get this properly dealt with in the courts. Very well. I will cease the fishing, but I will continue to use the substance that I have rendered thus far to continue the process. Like I said, you have a fortnight to get the management figured out. I certainly do not want to ruin this for the rest of the community. I just want to be able to continue my business. <sighs> my goodness, you are all persistent. Thank you, and please leave me to my work. Well, I guess all the crabs have escaped. The living crabs have escaped anyway. Now with Dahana's release yeah. of them. So even if he sort of snuck out and tried to catch some more, it'll take him a while to do that. Well, I'll put up some them. animal sentinels to, to watch out if he tries to go back on his word. All right. So the Cephala squad, along with Clog, have managed to find a nefarious plot of a man who was fishing for crabs to help a community of people. It turns out that it wasn't exactly black or white as to whether or not it was a good or a bad thing. And so they have looked into new management practices and have ceased the fishing of the crabs altogether in the hopes that they will be able to build back up and create a sustainable population with a sustainable fishery. That's the end of our episode for this workshop. Thank you so much for listening. This was a fun adventure. Fun. Do you have any questions uh, about how one does podcasts for science communication? Yeah, yeah. we're workshopping now. So if you want to know anything about everything from the start to the finish of when we get together with a dumb idea about wanting to play Dungeons and Dragons at a conference to putting out a full podcast or a full YouTube video, we're, we're happy to answer anything. Yeah, I, I'm actually curious. Any questions or thoughts or feedback or cool okay. stories about gaming? Uh, I guess as a general question, you mentioned that. So you have the data on um, whether people think they're learning things. Mm -hmm. But have you looked into it all? I know there's always the question of like, are people just getting information or are people actually like forming meaningful connections to this? So have you tried to do any questions around that or? Um we would like to do more of that. Uh, to be honest, we, so the sample size of the, the survey was, was low. And that's because I think we, we, we dropped our survey on like February 20th, 2020. So it was out for about a month and then the world dissolved around us. And so we, we tried really hard to kind of get a little bit more, but we left it open for about a year and um, we got what we got. So if I was to do this again, though, um, I would be really interested in doing um, maybe perhaps a little bit more focused. Um, ideally, I would like to interview people sort of before and then have them listen and then see if there's after. There, there could be more thorough ways to do this. Mm -hmm. um, so there's always opportunities moving forward. Um, but, you know, we are kind of limited with what we were um, in terms of sample size because of the pandemic, unfortunately. <laughs> There are definitely some sort of individual on this. Sorry. Yeah. I said, I'd love to do a PhD on this. Mm. this <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely some individual impacts because um, Alana, who ended up working your lab, met us through the Dugongs and Sea Dragons event at AwesomeCon. She drove down as a fan and then decided that she was going to go to SUNY because of, um, because of the show. I don't know if it was just because of us, but it certainly didn't. It was hurt. definitely a factor. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I will say that, like, from my life, there is anecdotal evidence, which is not the best 
data, but uh, you know, sample size of like four uh, friends who have listened to our podcast and other podcasts, um, but specifically from uh, Dugongs uh, and how like they, oh, I didn't know this or like learning certain things from it um, on my side. But again, anecdotal evidence is, is not a big sample size. Yeah. And there's lots of back and forth about the validity of anecdotal evidence, because I feel the same way. I feel like if we went to our Twitter account right now, anecdotally, we would have a lot of people that say that they're making those connections. And um, the problem with that is, is we're just, we're just in an echo chamber. We can't just throw it out to, it's not like we could do a Reddit AMA and well, we could, but like if we did a Reddit AMA, we wouldn't necessarily get a sample of people that would actually tell us anything right so i don't know i heard that anecdotal evidence is great <laughs> <laughs> yeah particularly if it's the cousin of Nicki minaj oh yeah um, <laughs> uh topical topical we yeah. we do have the scientific secrets mm -hmm. series of books as well which we got involved yeah. with because of zeke who is a, oh, yeah. a fan of the show and um just looking at my my um royalties <laughs> from that i mean that those are selling those are definitely selling mm -hmm. um and in and, terms of downloads they're more successful than any of my scientific papers that i've ever produced you mean and, you mean you make bus fare both to and from work oh god <laughs> so but the thing is just for our listening audience and the people who are in the audience who might not know uh what, what we're talking about there these are dm books like creatures or settings that are built with uh science and uh based off of scientific papers like each creature that's created is referencing a specific uh scientific uh piece of literature where it's like like i made a ghost pistol shrimp a uh, giant ghost pistol, pistol shrimp once and it was referencing uh, a specific paper on some of the uh, defense mechanisms of that specific species and turned it into a playable a, a monster that can be easily put into a salt marsh campaign mm -hmm. so it's impacting um, while we don't have the data on the back end of how those types of elements are influencing the user or the consumer, it's still an interesting area that we should be and will be looking at in the future about how this is resonating with the larger community. We, we should probably get from Zeke how many copies have been sold <laughs> yeah, um, in terms cool. of the discussion of the, the paper, because that's, that's oh, an yeah. additional bonus. Yeah, I, uh, I that. something that I like to in, in the work that I've been doing for this campaign, this is the first one off that I've done as a DM. I'm working on the second season as the DM, but it's something I like to call fictozoology. So I like to take fictional creatures and apply real biologic, like uh, physiological, biological, ecological processes to them. So you get to it's like what Andrew was saying, you're taking something scientific and you're turning it into something fantastic that people can um, sort of envision in their minds, get really attracted to the same way that you, you get attracted to the natural world and get excited about the connections in like a BBC planet earth or blue planet type documentary. Um, it's cool because it's fantastical. Actually, uh, David Attenborough has done that in the past. He had this whole um, sciencing mythical creatures series way back in the day back in the 1980s can we get david Attenborough to be the next guest voice on our show oh, i will work on it oh let's get yeah. that let's get that oh going gosh. yeah we'll make him the next oracle that would be awesome <laughs> or maybe yeah, like an does... evil dude that would be awesome oh too. we can an make evil david Attenborough. A... he can be a villain yes like a collector yes <laughs> oh yes all right i'm gonna there's been pretty personal oh, oh sorry no i was gonna say Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, pretty personal connections directly from those books to the podcast because I did uh, my character Pepper who is a, a paladin of trickery in the ocean who rides a giant otter steed I statted out the giant otter steed in uh, the, the Salt Marsh books so I drew a picture of it <laughs> it was very yeah cool. I guess your your art has has grown because of the connection yeah. Oh, hugely, hugely, yeah. absolutely. I've gotten more work through um, 
Zeke and the relations in this podcast than I have anywhere else. <laughs>